Fulton Bourne edits the news. Good afternoon, everybody. The Senate today agreed that at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, it will vote on the motion by Senator Charles W. Tobey, Republican of New Hampshire, to recommit the neutrality bill. And the purpose of that recommitment is to separate the title and carry provisions of the new Neutrality Act and the particular provision which repeals the embargo on munitions. Now, the purpose of that move is to get the cash and carry provisions through. Practically everyone has agreed on those. And those who want to keep the embargo will be in a much better position to do that if the cash and carry provisions can be separated from the embargo measure and put through apart from it. There's no dispute on the one. There's a great deal of dispute on the other. But the administration leaders who have made the concessions on the cash and carry provisions in order to secure the repeal on the embargo are certainly not going to permit that particular strategy to interfere with what they want to do. However, if they should be defeated in the vote, then it is perfectly obvious that those who oppose any repeal of the embargo would be in a much better position to carry on their fight. In the first place, they'd begin hurrying to immediate adjournment. They'd say, why should we go on debating here? Let's quit. Let's go home. Let's not do any more talking that might interfere with the European war. And they'd probably add, if you don't let us go home without repealing the embargo, we're just going to fight on and fight on until we have our way. We're not going to permit the embargo to be repealed if we can possibly help it. Now, the administration forces anticipate that kind of action, and that's why they're not going to permit it if they can help it. And for that reason, when the vote comes at 2 p.m. on Tuesday on this particular motion, it's bound to be taken as an indication of what the final lineup on the embargo and the repeal of the embargo is going to be. Now, some senators contend, no, that's not a fair test. Others say, yes, it is a fair test. But I think it's a safe guess that a great many people will assume that it is a test of the strength of the administration on this particular issue. And so the vote at 2 o'clock tomorrow will be looked forward to with a good deal of interest. The predictions that have come out from Washington is that the administration forces will win and that the cash and carry provisions of the new Neutrality Act will not be separated from the provision which calls for the repeal of the embargo on the export of munitions. There's been a good deal of naval action today. Very little action on the land fronts, but quite a little on the naval fronts. Nazi warships have been out in the North Sea. A German naval squadron was sighted by British forces on Sunday evening, but it escaped under cover of darkness. The German ships, it's interesting to note, were not sighted by British patrol ships but they were sighted by British reconnaissance planes. Now that again proves the importance and the value of aircraft in connection with modern naval war. As we look back on everything that has happened during the past month, we must conclude that airplanes are of tremendous importance in connection with modern fleets. And it is safe to say that all these lessons are not being lost on the experts, military and naval, who are presiding over the military destinies of this country. You must remember that this is really the first time that modern aircraft have worked under war conditions on anything like a large scale. And so everything that is happening in connection with this naval war is of tremendous importance. A German warplane landed in Denmark today by mistake. The crew set fire to the craft and destroyed it before giving themselves up to the Danish authorities for internment. That reminds me of what I was told in Spain, that the Germans have certain special devices on all their planes and that the crews are under instructions that if they should be brought down, their first duty is to destroy those particular devices so that potential enemies may not get hold of them. The French have reported a successful attack on a German submarine. They give no particulars. That's the policy 
of both the French and British navies with reference to warfare against submarines. They believe that the morale of German submarine crews is apt to be affected if all that happens is that the submarine disappears, does not return, and no one knows just what happened to it. Five German ships with accommodations for 3,000 passengers have arrived at Latvian ports, and one has already departed with a load of Germans. This is Germany's policy of evacuating all Germans in the Baltic states. It's a curious policy. It's one that indicates that Germany does not anticipate continually good relations with Soviet Russia, for it is the intervention of Soviet Russia in that region which seems to have given the immediate impetus to this idea of evacuation. And in connection with the general developments of the international situation, it's interesting to note that we have the first Italian newspaper attack on communism since the signing of the Soviet-German non-aggression pact. Remember that bringing the Soviet Union into a closer relation to the Rome-Berlin axis was the signal for the cessation of attacks on communism in the Italian press. Now suddenly, in whose paper? In Marshal Italo Balbo's paper, there is a very vigorous anti-communist attack. Note my emphasis on Marshal Balbo. He has been mentioned as the most likely man to fight any move that might develop in Italy against the Mussolini regime or against policies of the Mussolini regime with which certain factions among the fascists are likely to disagree. And any policy which lined up Italy alongside of communist Russia would meet with a lot of determined opposition in Italy. And the significant thing is that Marshal Balbo has had the courage to permit his newspaper to speak such words as these. Italians were born anti-communists and want to remain anti-communists. Russians are tragic buffoons, professional tricksters, and models of vulgar bestiality, living monsters, the most infamous which history can recall. Those are strong words for such a good friend of Adolf Hitler's as Comrade Stalin seems to be in these days. And we get word also from the Balkans that Russo-German efforts to dominate the Black Sea are not going so well. Turkey is holding out against Moscow. In Moscow, for the Turkish foreign minister has been there for more than two weeks, and Soviet Russia has been unable to get from him what it wants. He's staying on. Turkey doesn't want to give up its friendship with Soviet Russia, which it has had now for 20 years. But neither does it want to give up its friendship with France and England. The most important battle of the Second World War is underway. This is the peace offensive which was launched by the Nazi party as soon as the conquest of Poland was completed. It got underway in full force with Adolf Hitler's Reichstag speech on Friday. It has found support from Lloyd George, Bernard Shaw, and certain labor rights in England, from the communist deputies in France, and from the Italian press. And today, the Moscow government newspaper is Vestia, joins the ever-potent cry of peace. It is impossible, says the official Soviet organ, to exterminate any idea or any opinion by fire and sword. One may respect or hate Hitlerism or any other system of political opinions. This is a matter of taste. But to begin a war for the extermination of Hitlerism means to admit to criminal silliness in policy. Perhaps it would not be unfair to ask whether it was criminally silly for the Soviet Union to exterminate almost its entire army general staff because, under the leadership of the able Tukhachevsky, this staff, not so long ago, sought an understanding with the Nazis. Queen Wilhelmina announces today that she will remain aloof from all European peace moves for the present. And Premier Edouard Daladier, apprehensive about the continuance of this peace drive, about the efforts to bring President Roosevelt into it, has suddenly decided that he will not await Chamberlain's answer to Hitler on Wednesday but that tomorrow at 8 p.m. he is going to speak 8 p.m. French time. He's going to define in detail the war aims of France and he's going to reply to Hitler when Hitler called upon the Allies to state their war aims. 
And today, in the United States Senate, there was a motion for a three-day peace recess in the neutrality debate. Senator Johnson, Democrat of Colorado, who's never appeared until now as an expert on foreign affairs, suddenly asks the Senate to recess for three days in order to give President Roosevelt an opportunity to move for an armistice in Europe's war. But naturally, administration senators who know how dangerous it would be to attempt to force the hand of any neutral leader at this particular time on that issue. Those senators objected, and the motion was not put. You must remember the tremendous pressure has been put on President Roosevelt to intervene. You must remember that the European situation is extremely delicate. Russia, Germany, and Italy are using all their diplomatic and personal resources in the United States to force White House action. They are supported by sincere peace-loving elements in the United States who believe that any kind of peace is better than any kind of war. And so, everything that happens now, particularly any suggestion that comes from abroad, must be carefully examined. Good evening.